Good morning, and welcome to this edition of Medical Minutes, brought to you by Passive and Hospital. Today's topic is gallbladder disease. My guest is a new member of the Jacksonville community and Passive and Hospital's medical staff, Dr. Abigail White. Dr. White is a general surgeon affiliated with Springfield Clinic. On behalf of our listening audience, I welcome you, Dr. White, to the community. The first question I'd like to start our discussion with, what exactly is a gallbladder and what does it do? Well, the gallbladder is an organ that uh, is a branch off of the bile ducts, which run from the liver into the intestines. And the liver makes bile and delivers it to the intestines to help us absorb fats and fat-soluble vitamins. The gallbladder is what I tell people is kind of the cul-de-sac off the side of these main bile ducts, and it collects the bile and concentrates it and changes it in order to be stored and used when people are, after people have eaten. So it basically aids in digestion. Right. So what are the signs and symptoms of gallbladder disease? Well, gallbladders can have a lot of different problems, and depending upon the problem you have, you will have different signs and symptoms. Some of the classic symptoms, especially for non-emergent gallbladder problems, include pain after eating, sometimes up to an hour after eating. And this is pain that's usually located in the right side of the abdomen, kind of underneath the ribs. Often it'll radiate to the person's back or to their scapula. And not everyone has this pain only after meals, but if it is after meals, it's frequently fatty meals. Other people say that they just experience a lot of pain at night, and that can be a sign or symptom. Bloating, belching, these things can all go along with our most common gallbladder problems. For our listening audience, the scapula basically is your shoulder blade. Then people with maybe the signs and symptoms who are going to your office for a workup, what type of blood test or imaging studies may you use to help diagnose their problem? Well, there are a set of function tests of the liver called liver function tests, very appropriately named, that can give us some clue as to what may, might be going on with a person's gallbladder. Other labs include a white blood cell count to tell us whether or not the gallbladder has become infected. And then ultrasounds can see stones inside the gallbladder and oftentimes can also see stones that have escaped from the gallbladder and are now in the ducts. It can tell us the size of the duct and whether or not there's a potential that stones have previously passed through this region. CT scans can often tell us the same information, although they're a little bit more likely to miss some stones. And then for the people who don't have stones and have problems with the function of their gallbladder, then we start to look at studies like a HIDA scan, which is a nuclear medicine scan that tells us about the squeezing ability of the gallbladder. You uh, did mention gallstones. Say a person does have gallstones, do all of them need their gallbladder removed then? No, certainly not. Actually, a large percentage of the population has gallstones, somewhere up to 12%. And of these people, only about 20 to 30 of them will ever have symptoms in the next 20 years. That's a long time. And many of these people will develop symptoms before they would ever go on to develop a more serious complication of their gallstones. So it's very low risk to have a gallbladder with stones in it that's not causing any symptoms. I know that there's basically two different types of procedures. One is the laparoscopic and one is the open. Why do some people have to have a laparoscopic procedure and why do some people necessitate an open gallbladder procedure? Well, the procedure of rem- from removing the gallbladder was initially done open and as technology developed and we began to have the capabilities of taking them out laparoscopically, what we found was that there are some people who can't have their gallbladders safely removed laparoscopically and through the experience and, and unfortunate episodes that some people have experienced, we've learned that if we're not able to see all of the structures that we plan to cut, as well as some of the structures around the area, then there's a chance for an injury, especially to something called the common bile duct. If the whole layout is not seen adequately, a surgeon should not proceed blindly start cutting things, which uh, seems obvious, but um, it can be really difficult to tell when you're in there. Sometimes the two different 
ducts or tubes that need to be evaluated can be stuck to each other. One of them needs to be cut and one of them really needs to not be cut. And so in order for patient safety, there is something called the critical view of safety. And if that can't be obtained, then we go ahead and open people up and take it out the old-fashioned way because the risk of injuring that main duct is very significant. If that duct is injured, it can scar, it can leak, it does not heal well at all, and it generally means that that patient's going to undergo a very major procedure in the next year. And it's not just one surgery. It's often many, many procedures first, ultimately culminating in one very large procedure, which also is a high-risk procedure. So we don't just take people's gallbladders out laparoscopically unless we can do it safely. So basically, it is tailored to the individual patient and their anatomy and and their comorbidities and everything, correct? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, People who have infection, people who have had long-standing inflammation, People who have had stones passed through their gallbladder. These are all things that can affect how we're able to do it. People who have lung disease are sometimes not able to tolerate the way we expand the abdomen in order to see and work in a laparoscopic setting, and they're not a candidate for laparoscopy for any procedure, let alone the the gallbladder removal. And for clarification, there are times, and, and probably more than we'd like to admit, but a person is scheduled first for a laparoscopic, and like you said, because of the anatomy, because you can't visualize, then they're converted to the open procedure during the actual surgical course, correct? Certainly, yes, and that's one of the most common ways for uh, an open gallbladder to happen is that it's initially scheduled as a laparoscopic, but based upon the findings, then they need to be converted to an open. And that happens about 5 to 10% of the time nationally. It's just a part of, of gallbladder surgery. Speaking of the two, there's probably a, a big difference in post-op course. Can you elaborate a little bit between a person who had a laparoscopic cholecystectomy or removal of the gallbladder versus an open procedure? The laparoscopic procedure is generally an inpatient or an outpatient procedure where someone can come in the same day and go home later on that afternoon and continue healing at home. They often find that they have three to five days where they're not doing much, and then over the next two weeks, they continue to get better. This can vary greatly among individuals, but generally within two to three weeks, these patients are feeling pretty well back on their feet and doing most normal things. Now, the open procedure is quite a bit more painful. We do have to go through some muscle in order to take it out open, and it's kind of right in an area that that muscle gets pulled on every time you take a breath and move, and so generally these people experience quite a bit more pain and have a longer recovery period. They're going to be tired for a little bit longer. They're going to stay in the hospital for a few days and wait for their bowel function to return and for them to be able to eat, but they'll eventually get to the point that the laparoscopic people will too and and recover and be on the road to health just like their counterparts who went through a lesser course. You basically said, though, the laparoscopic is done as an outpatient, but correct me if I'm wrong, there are some cases where that patient might have to stay a day or two even though it was done laparoscopically. Yes, that can happen, especially in cases where somebody has come in with an infection. Oftentimes, they're admitted before their procedure and then have their procedure and maybe go home a day or two following. If there's any concerns based upon either the disease process they have or the anatomy or if they're not able to tolerate a diet. Those are some things that can bring people into the hospital for a day or two after a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. So when I have mine taken out, I'm going to wish for the laparoscopic, correct? (laughs) It depends on if you're a glutton for punishment. (laughs) We all hear the case where the patient will complain, my surgeon won't take out my gallbladder even though I'm having the same maybe signs, symptoms of a family member or their mother when their gallbladder went bad. Can you explain why there is that case like that? The symptoms that patients have with gallbladder problems, to kind of lump them all together, can really mimic some of the symptoms of other common diseases. So ulcerative disease, gastric reflux or GERD, a hernia, and even some 
other disease processes that are less common can all mimic gallbladder disease. And if we just took the gallbladders out of every person who thought that they probably had the same thing their mom had, we would be exposing a lot of people to an unnecessary risk. And then they'd come back in our office postoperatively and be a little bit upset that they didn't have the resolution of symptoms that they thought that they would get. Although the surgery is very safe, uh, the mortality, the percentage of people who die from the procedure is somewhere around 0.3%. So it's not zero. It's very low, very safe, but it's not zero. But complications can be around 7 to 10%. Some of these are minor complications and some of these are more major. So again, although it's very safe, we always want to weigh the risks and the benefits of what we're doing. And until we're certain that there's some benefit to gain, we need to make sure that we're not exposing our patients to undue risk. You did say an ulcer can mimic gallbladder disease, correct? Yes, it can. Ulcerative disease, gastritis, and reflux can all be very common scenarios where the gallbladder is suspected, but ultimately it turns out to be something else. As we close, is there anything else you'd like to add about gallbladder disease? Gallbladder disease is very common, and if anyone out there feels that they may be experiencing the symptoms of gallbladder disease, they should seek the care and evaluation of their primary care physician. And for those people who have these types of symptoms and it lasts more than five hours and even into 24 hours, these are signs and symptoms along with fever that should result in a trip to the ER for evaluation if it's not getting better. Well, thank you for coming this morning, Dr. White. Very interesting conversation. Thanks for listening.